Hello and welcome to the latest edition of GRC and Cybersecurity Podcast. In today's episode, we've got a very special guest, Jim Dempsey. We're going to talk about the latest changes in the US approach to cybersecurity policy. Hi, Jim. Can you introduce yourself and tell the listeners a little bit about the company that you work for? I'm Jim Dempsey. I am a lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley Law School, where I teach a course in cybersecurity law to our LLM students. And I'm also senior policy advisor at the Stanford Cyber Policy Center, where I research and write on issues of cybersecurity policy. Fantastic. Before we get any further, one of the things I always like to ask is, what do you get up to outside of work? So obviously you live, breathe cybersecurity and and policy, but what else do you do? Well, my wife and I love the outdoors and uh, we love to walk almost every weekend. We're up on what we call the Marin Headlands, which is just across the Golden Gate Bridge, beautiful area of uh, state and federal parkland. And on vacations, we love to take uh, sort of long distance walks town to town. This year, we're finally going to do the Camino of Santiago in Spain, uh, part of it called the Primitivo, uh, walking uh, from Oviedo, course of 10 days, 11 days to Santiago de Compostela. Fantastic. Sounds amazing. Can you talk the listeners a little bit about what your role is now? And then I guess, what has been your kind of pathway into cybersecurity? How did you end up getting into this space? I'm a lawyer. Um, I always point out to people I'm not a technologist, although I've picked up a lot just by osmosis. I graduated from law school in 1979, which is uh, before the real emergence of the internet uh, age. I sort of took a traditional, uh, what in the United States at least, is a a bit of a traditional path. Uh, I clerked for a judge uh, for a year after law school. I worked at a big uh, law firm in Washington, D.C. And then I transitioned to Capitol Hill uh, and worked for the U.S. Congress with the House Judiciary Committee, uh, which, among other things, has oversight over the FBI and has responsibility for some of the privacy laws in the United States, including the government surveillance laws, laws regulating wiretapping by the government. And that got me into the privacy issue. And by then, it was becoming clear that something very consequential was happening with digital technology, the emergence of, uh, at the time, mainframe computers, but the beginnings of the glimmer of uh, what ultimately became the internet. The congressman that I worked for uh, was very, very forward-looking, remarkably so, saw the significance of this technology, saw the power of it, And I spent a lot of time supporting him on trying to develop policy frameworks for this. After that, I went to the nonprofit sector and I worked for a advocacy group, a civil liberties group. I spent, again, a lot of time on Capitol Hill. I spent a lot of time on the post 9-11 issues in the United States, government surveillance, uh, wiretapping, uh, our Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Then I moved to Berkeley, ran a center on law and technology at Berkeley, and it was there that I got into cybersecurity. Up until then, cybersecurity was just emerging when I arrived at uh, Berkeley, and they asked me to teach a course on cybersecurity law, which no one else was teaching, uh, certainly at, at Berkeley at the time, and very few courses anywhere in the country. And the more I dove into it, the more and more fascinating I found it, Matt, because this was a, an area of the law that was being developed in real time. And to be able to observe that and contribute to it and comment on it and try to make sense of what's happening, that's been sort of my passion for the past six, seven years. Uh, produced a book, uh, Cybersecurity Law Fundamentals, right now a lot on these issues. And uh, obviously, we're going to dive into more where, where things stand and where they might be going. But that's my trajectory. Fantastic. Like, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on and I'm like, really excited to kind of get into some of the details. Let's talk a little bit about where you're spending your time currently. What are the key priorities that you're focused on? Uh, what are the things that you're working on right now? So what I'm, what I'm trying to do is to think through, from the U.S. perspective, how can we shape a effective legal framework for cybersecurity. And what we have in the United States right now is a, a patchwork quilt, uh, what one might call actually a crazy quilt, all different pieces of law, ancient common law doctrines of tort and trespass, early 20th century concepts of trade regulation, um, 
unfair and deceptive trade practices, which is a phrase going back to the 1930s in our Federal Trade Commission Act. Uh, We have criminal law, and uh, now increasingly, we have national security law, trade law, trade sanctions, um, controls on foreign investment, controls on foreign control of technology. So it's this piecing together of bits and pieces of law. And the question is, how does it fit together? How does it add up? What's effective? And so I tried initially to pull this together in my in my book um, and to try to give a coherent introduction, at least to lawyers, although I think some non-lawyers would benefit from it as well. And now over the past two or three years, I've been writing a series of pieces, blogs on it site called lawfareblog.com here in the United States, working through primarily at the federal level, but also to some extent commenting on the state level, because as as folks know, in the United States, we have a federal system and the states, all 50 states, do retain considerable power in this field still. And trying to think, how, how can we make this work? How does it make sense? How do we address the market failures? How do we still preserve uh, and encourage innovation? And how do we build basically a system of accountability, a system of governance? And I think it's a mat, a mix of private law, traditional, again, contracts, torts, private litigation, uh, private agreements, plus governmental regulation. And clearly the trend now in the United States, I can't speak for other parts of the world, but I think it's probably true as well. The trend is towards recognizing we're going to need more government intervention in the space. The market has not succeeded uh, in giving us the kind of security that we need for, given how utterly dependent we are in our personal lives, businesses, and our democracy, uh, how dependent we are on this technology. Yeah, I mean, you look across and it's only getting more, isn't it? Every single year you look at things like the Verizon and Data Breach Report and all of these things of like the volume and scale of security issues. And it, it's just getting bigger and Local organizations are trying to do something about it, but unless you kind of put in place laws, regulations and contractual requirements are great, but you also need to have some something from above, not just your suppliers to kind of push this forward. Exactly. And, and it has to happen both ways, doesn't it? I think, that, I think that's the thing here is it can't just be you've been put on pressure by suppliers. It's got to be, there's got, this is a minimum framework or standard that we have to adhere to. And then, Matt, the hard question becomes, how do you define that? standard of care. How do you define what is reasonable uh, security? Because the goal, of course, is not perfection, right? Yeah. The goal is not the dedicated attacker, given enough time, will get through. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to manage that risk. We're trying to mitigate that risk, trying to build resiliency in so that we can respond when the breach does occur. So if the goal is not perfection, but some reasonable, some approach, some cost-benefit-based, risk-based approach, actually putting that in words and measuring it, that's the challenge. And it's so hard, isn't it? Because you can't have a one-size-fit-all. You can't have a small organization that's a tech startup being put under the same things as a Fortune 500 company, right? That... <laughs> exactly. Well, and along at least two dimensions, you can't have one-size-fits-all. You can't have one-size-fits-all based upon size and scope. Yeah. But also, uh, you can't have one size fits all across all industries and all sectors. What's necessary f- and appropriate for the bulk electric power system or the nuclear power system, or for that matter, transportation, might be quite different from what's necessary for banking or healthcare or other uh, then, sectors. You get down to things like marketing software, right? Or just software in general that, that's maybe used for non critical processes. It's even less, isn't it? And it all just depends on, I guess, what data they have how you protect that data. And it, it, I guess this is going to what we get into is the complexity. There's so many wet, exactly. different layers. And now, on the other hand, and this is a theme that um, I've been grappling with in the administration, at least here in the United States, uh, the Biden administration is, is grappling with is this tension between sector by sector tailoring versus harmonization. I think we almost face the opposite risk, which is uh, too many different frameworks, too many different sets of requirements, too many different standards, and that will drive both the software and hardware manufacturers as well as the users crazy as well. So the challenge is is to identify what are the cross-cutting themes, and then you implement them along your sectoral uh, industry by industry verticals. 
we're already there, aren't they? I mean, if you look at some organizations and you look, it's like HIPAA, PCI, NIST, CMMC. I mean, I can keep going on and on and on. And it's exactly. like, you end up with four, five, six, seven hundred 700 control requirements. And it's like, okay, <laughs> right. At some, at some point this needs to be <laughs> harmonized. And, and I agree with you. And it, and it also needs to be then linked into what they do. And this is where it always gets very complex. So the big thing we're to talk about today is the White House a couple of weeks back, a month now, released the updated cybersecurity policy. Can you talk to the listeners who, I mean, obviously, yes, they may be aware, but obviously international listeners, can you talk us through the key takeaways from the, this updated policy? So every administration going back to the, the last millennium has had a cyber security strategy. Um, this is a document that the president and his team put together basically every four years or so outlining their vision for cybersecurity. And a couple of weeks ago, the Biden administration uh, issued theirs. And in many ways, it's a remarkable document. It, it breaks away from the approach that had dominated across party, Democratic or Republican presidents up until now, had all um, disavowed any regulatory intent. Going, starting back, I think, with Bill Clinton and going all the way through Barack Obama and into Donald Trump's administration, the mantra, the byword for cybersecurity policy was public private partnership. And public private partnership meant a lot of things, but among other things, it meant we're not going to regulate. The government is going to cajole, we're going to encourage, we're going to support, but we're not going to set legal requirements. And this Biden policy breaks away from that and sets out a new vision in a way that I think is necessary. The overall, just to set the framework, Matt, the, the, the policy has five pillars, three of which I think are continuations of what we've seen before and two of which represent this break. The five pillars are defend critical. The second is disrupt and dismantle threat actors, particularly using the criminal powers and the sanctions powers and the controls on money flows. The third is shaping market forces to drive security and resiliency. The fourth is to invest in a resilient future. And the fifth is to build and support international partnerships. Now on international partnerships, investment, basically government funding for research, and the disrupt and dismantle pieces, those are continuations of things that have been underway and have been themes of all of these policies going back years. Clearly, it's a global problem. We need to work with our, our allies and um, even with uh, adversaries and competitors. We need to try to find ways to cooperate uh, when we can. With Russia, up until the Ukraine invasion, there was uh, cooperation on some criminal investigative matters, even with Russia. So working with partners, Using the criminal law and the, the sanctions law and the laws on um, money flows, using some of the seizure powers that the government has to seize uh, domain names and websites and some of the infrastructure used by the bad guys to launch their attacks and to control their, control their uh, own criminal infrastructure. Those are traditional themes and they've been underway and this administration is ramping up some of those, but it, it's more a matter of continuation and, and evolution. Where the revolution occurs is on the other two pillars, critical infrastructure and software. The uh, administration prompted by the Colonial Pipeline incident. You'll remember and your listeners and viewers will remember the Colonial Pipeline incident of a couple of years ago where yeah. ransomware attackers, probably unwittingly, uh, maybe not quite knowing what they were doing, <laughs> um, infiltrated and, and locked up the system of a major pipeline which delivered fuel, uh, all kinds of fuel, home heating fuel, jet airplane fuel, gasoline, through the entire eastern coast of the United States from the oil fields of Texas all the way up to the refineries of New Jersey. Uh, the pipeline was shut down and that sort of brought home the risk to critical infrastructure and to operational technology. Up until then, a lot of the focus had been on IT, information technology, and personal information, theft of credit card data, theft of personal data to be used in identity theft and other kinds of fraud, as well as theft of personal data by nation state adversaries for intelligence purposes. But Colonial Pipeline brought home the threat to operational technology, even though the attack itself was not against the uh, OT of the, the pipeline. 
Yeah. Um, and the fact that, again, all of these critical infrastructures are totally, totally networked, totally dependent upon uh, remotely accessible and network technology. So the administration began to do what no administration had really done before, with a couple of prior exceptions, which is to regulate, specifically regulate the major critical infrastructures. Before Colonial Pipeline, there had been rules, quite extensive and quite good rules for the bulk electric power system and for the nuclear energy uh, plants. And there had been some rules as well for the banking sector, but pretty much everything else was unregulated. Healthcare, transportation, pipelines, telecommunications, uh, local electrical distribution, uh, on and on and on and on. And the administration, very soon after the Colonial Pipeline uh, incident, issued an emergency directive to the pipelines. Uh, there are just a handful of major pipeline companies in the United States, as I assume there are in most other countries, for the first time ever imposing specific cybersecurity requirements on them. The administration followed that up a little later than that with somewhat similar regulations for railroads. And they said that they intended to do more. And in this strategy, they basically said, we're going to use existing authority where we have it. And then we are going to ask Congress to fill in the gaps for any sectors where the existing regulatory structure doesn't quite extend to cybersecurity. And they, I've been calling for a similar efforts on telecoms yeah. uh, and internet generally. I mean, the sort of communications backbone, hospitals, Hospitals are, of course, heavily regulated in the United States. We have, by and large, private hospitals, but they're heavily regulated because they're funded in part through the government uh, healthcare system, Medicare and Medicaid, on up till now, yeah. regulates a lot else. So, so the scope of these things is, is pretty huge, isn't it? So, I mean, the critical infrastructure is basically the government saying in anything that we deem that, I guess, us as a nation depend on, we are now going to put in key security requirements or the things that you exactly. need to be doing. Exactly. And, and this and this is before been left down to, I guess, governing bodies or the organizations themselves to complete. It was left to the organizations themselves. And again, it was all this voluntary guidelines. There's, there were guidelines for every sector, including guidelines issued by the government. But no, it was sort of every entity for itself and it was strictly voluntary. And so here we have the first major shift by the Biden administration and the first revolutionary, not evolutionary, but revolutionary element of this new strategy, in a way ratifying what started with the response to the Colonial Pipeline incident and saying, we have to look at these critical infrastructures and we have to become more interventionist, more regulatory, and specifically hold them to the task. Now, I'm in the process of publishing a three-part series on lawfareblog.com talking about, okay, now how are you going to enforce that? This was my next question. It's like, has it got the teeth and how are you going to get people to demonstrate they're doing it? So far, I think, um, don't go far enough. They do require, uh, by and large, as a theme across these directives that the government has issued so far, requires companies to develop and submit to the government for government approval cybersecurity plans. So they're saying to the companies, basically, you know your networks, you know your problem, do what you're supposed to do, which is do your threat assessment, do your risk assessment, look at your network, decide what the vulnerabilities are and decide on your own what are the elements that you need in your cybersecurity plan. But they have to address, obviously, patch management, access control, network segmentation, uh, authentication, et cetera, the sort of basics of any plan. But then you come up with the controls, submit them to us. Then you must do an annual um, assessment of the effectiveness. And again, this is sort of like cybersecurity 101, right? This is the basics of cybersecurity. Uh, whatever plan you put in place, you've got to constantly go back to and reassess. Um, there's some reporting requirements in there in terms of reporting of incidents that do occur. Um, but by and large, we haven't uh, bitten the bullet yet on where we need to go, I think, which is we are going to need some form of government inspection, some form of government backup. My current series, I'm writing about the issues that occur when you have self-certification and self-assessment 
I can only agree with you on this because people look, I mean, you've got to trust that people do the right thing, but there are going to be people who don't, right? There's going to be organizations. I mean, we're seeing it with everything that's going on in the banking at the moment and other things like organizations exactly. on the left are kind of, that they're, and, that, and again, that's in a highly regulated right. industry. This happens like people right. are not going to always be truthful in what right. they're submitting in and, these plans. And, you know, and it starts, it starts right, right with the risk assessment. So if you lowball it, on the risk side and minimize your risk, then you can get away with a lightweight plan. So it all goes back to someone is going to have to second guess in essence or assess the risk assessment judge. Have you correctly uh, identified the risk you face? And then the controls. And as, as you well know, Matt, there's a big difference between having a plan and implementing the plan. So the first question is, do you have a plan? Is it, does it look like a good plan? The second question is, is the plan actually being adhered to throughout the enterprise? Or are you seeing lots of exceptions where, yes, we have rules on uh, authentication or we have rules on software development or we have rules on uh, adding a new box uh, here or a new piece of gear there. But, oh, in this case here, we're in a hurry. So we're, we're, or there's a business need. We're going to ignore it. So is the plan being followed? And then the third question, which right now no one has an answer to, is the plan actually effective? So right now, as you know, we do not have a good system of metrics for uh, what you in a business sense you would think of as an ROI. All these security things we're doing, are they actually working? And are they actually drawing down that risk? Are they actually giving us a return in terms of greater resilience? So we're going to have to work that through. It's going to take time. You know, I go back in, in the United States, bank regulation began in 1864 in the middle of our civil war between the North and the South. And President Lincoln was just huge amounts of money were flowing into the economy of the North in order to uh, support this war effort, this massive, bloody and highly destructive civil war that we fought. But this huge amount of money throwing through the banking system, Lincoln and others were worried that this posed a huge amount of risk. So in 1864, we established a federal system of bank oversight, including bank regulators going in and actually looking at the balance sheets and trying to get the ground truth, trying to say, okay, here's what it says on the books. Let me actually see where the money is. When that started, we probably did not have a, a cadre of bank examiners in the country. We probably did not have the expertise but we built it up. We built it up over time and we built it up for uh, regulating the securities markets in the 30s, 1930s. We built it up uh, in the 40s and 50s for commercial air transportation and air, air safety and have a remarkably good and effective air safety system. So I think that's where we are on cybersecurity. We're just at the beginning. It's going to take time, but we clearly need to go there. You talked about two pillars. So I think we, we've covered the critical infrastructure. I think the other one you said was pillar three. Do you mind doing a bit of a deep dive on that as well? So pillar three, again, is one of the, is the other revolutionary aspect of this in which the administration calls out what everybody knows, but which no one from a policy standpoint has really grappled with until now. The software that we are all dependent upon is just riddled with bugs. It's riddled with insecurities. And up until now, software makers by and large have been able, at least in the United States under our legal system, have been able to evade liability for the consequential damages that might flow from the flaws in their software. They do this primarily by contract when you buy the software or now increasingly, of course, when you rent the software as a service. The terms of service or the contract or the license Basically, the software maker disavows liability for any follow-on consequences if the software is, uh, is flawed. We have to find a way to break out of that. The administration, up until now, the feeling has been, well, the market will demand good software and market forces will drive us towards more and more secure software. And the administration starts this pillar three with what I think is an indisputable fact, the market has failed. The market forces alone have failed to produce secure software. And we see that time and again. So we need to readjust and respond to that market failure with some kind of liability framework. 
And I say some kind because nobody quite knows what that's going to look like. We have to balance the interests of at least three interests, the aim for better security, the desire to continue to promote and support innovation, and thirdly, ensuring a competitive uh, ecosystem and not one in which the big guys, who I think feel that they're going to be able to comply with whatever security rules are put on them, that the big guys don't drive out the innovators and the small guys and the startups. Balancing those three interests, and there may be others that need to be put in the mix, but balancing the three interests of security, innovation, and competition is not easy. I think that's going to be a, a fairly big challenge, to be honest. I think like a lot of, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? And it all varies even depending on the type of software. I mean, look, we, we're a security firm. That kind of what's in our nature is what we do. We work in GRC, right? So it's kind of something that inherently is built in our practices. But then you might be talking about someone who does, I don't want to pick on marketing, but marketing tech, right? Or it could be social media. Are the requirements of what they need to do the same? Probably not. Well, and exactly. And the, and the first question, the threshold question is, of all those different makers of software, which ones are you actually going to put this liability on? You know, there are lots of apps or other little widgets, plugins or whatever that don't matter, don't really, aren't critical, um, don't need to have that kind of a regulatory framework. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Let the innovation proceed apace. So the first question is, is going to be defining what's the size of that box of what is that software that we do feel is so critical. I mean, obviously, if you're talking about operating system software, yes. Other sort of mission critical or widely dispersed. Obviously, there are a few software products that are widely dispersed across industries. Those are the ones that we need to target, but writing that definition is not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously, we work with large clients and you're obviously, there is software liability in a lot of our contracts, but they're capped at certain amounts. And, it, and a lot of that is, I guess, within reason. I guess it's when you talk about some of the big people out there, some of these huge companies you're talking about who can basically just say, we're not signing up to that. You either work with us and we take set no liability, where I think this is going to affect the most, isn't it, for these big companies where they've been able to just say, well, look, you need to work with us. <laughs> if not. Well, that's right. That's right. And the power of the contract and, and, you know, and look, a lot of them do put effort into security, obviously, and are, you know, we have Patch Tuesday um, every single month. Uh, Microsoft ships uh, updates, many of them for security purposes. One thing that's critical to appreciate here, Matt, is this is a multi-year effort. Uh, people cannot look at this strategy and think, oh, how's he going to do that? Uh, how's Biden going to do that? He can't get anything through Congress anyhow. This is a multi-year strategy. Um, I'm actually in the process of convening a a workshop of academics, people who have written on this issue, people from the field of torts, people from the field of insurance law, people from the field of software design. I've got both lawyers and technologists. And we're planning to spend a year <laughs> writing and thinking about this and putting stuff out there, putting ideas out there. And others will be putting ideas out there as well. But again, I think the basic premise of the strategy is undeniably correct, that uh, the market has failed. In fact, if anything, the market has driven these companies to innovate so rapidly and to push out products that are insecure. So there's almost currently a perverse incentive to ship, to move to new features, new add-ons, new functionality. And security has too often taken sort of second priority there. And basically what the administration is saying is we need to reshape those market forces. It kind of feels, doesn't it, like it's saying, actually, you need to make sure that you, if you have to stand in court, or if someone you got pulled in, you had a defensible position. At your decisions, you can act upon them and go, actually, I did all these things. Yes, something went wrong. Third party reviews, look, we've, we've assessed them, but it still went wrong. But we did the right things. Well, and in fact, that's exactly what the administration calls out in the strategy. It says if in order to create a system of software accountability, we need three things. One, we need to define the standard of care. What are 
the secure software development methodologies, which I mean, obviously NIST has our National Institute of Standards and Technologies has published those. There are other frameworks for secure software development. What is the standard of care? Two, how do we overcome those contractual terms? And then three, safe harbor. If you do everything right, and again, the standard is not perfection. The standard is some the standard of care. Point number one, standard of care is not you must build perfectly secure software. The standard is going to be you must build reasonably secure software, and this is how to do it. But if you do everything right, you should, I think, be protected from liability, even if you miss something and the bad guys found something and the bad guys got through. Yeah, it shouldn't be a stick to completely, you know, beat the, like the hell out of you, but it should be something that actually you go, well, look, you're setting a good practice. And if you do these things as an industry, we agree, actually, you've done the right things and you should be I'm not going to say secure, but you, you've done more than enough that, that is reasonable and, and things can go wrong. A person can make a mistake, a patch is deployed slightly wrong, right? There is things that can happen, right? Misconfiguration of software from a junior person. These things can happen. You can make mistakes, but it, it's got to be in line with actually your processes and procedures are tested and working in the right way. And that's the system we're trying to build. Now, you know, we've, for better or for worse, um, we, we have built that for other products and other sectors. You know, we have toaster law. If my toaster in my kitchen has a, a, a short circuit and catches on fire and my kitchen catches on fire, we can go and we can look at that, the design of the toaster. And, we, and there are standards against which we can match the design of that toaster. And by the way, if my computer, this is crazy, but if my computer happened to have been left in the kitchen and my computer burns up, I can recover against the toaster maker, not only for the cost of the value of the toaster, but also for the damage to my kitchen and for the loss of data and the damage to my computer. But currently, if my computer blows up or if the data in my computer is compromised, I cannot recover against the software maker. And that's partly because Again, these contracts, the terms of service, limit their liability and say, well, we'll repay you the cost of the software, but we're not going to repay you for the damage to your, your business, which was knocked offline for X number of days and you lost X millions of dollars. Only your, your, our liability is limited to the value of the contract. Yeah, and, and it's just not fair, is it? I mean, it, it's the, the fair and equal terms of a contract, isn't it? What, what you want is to feel like both people are being fair. You're not asking for, say, like, we want an uncapped liability because obviously that's, that's not realistic. But actually, if we were to lose business operations and this is a critical system, there's got to be some skin in both our games, right? This can't be a one-way contract. Exactly. And what I'm trying to do in some of my research and what I'm urging others who know even more about the history of liability law is to look at what, how has this evolved in other sectors? I mean, we've been here before. We've been here with um, automobiles. We've been here with medical devices. Uh, we've been here with just ordinary consumer products. That's the, going to be the debate, the challenge, the goal over the next two, three, four years, if not longer. I guess thinking about this then, so we've gone through this in quite a bit of detail, but I mean, I guess listening to you, I guess the key challenges are obviously making sure this is embedded and let's say tested, or there's an independent body making sure that obviously once this, this guidance has gone out, these requirements that people are actually sticking to them. Other ones is obviously unpicking some of contracts that may have been placed a long time. What, what, what other big challenges do you see for, for this to be successful? I see the critical infrastructure issue and the software issue as sort of separate issues. I'm promoting, I think we need to move to a sort of inspections, um, government supervision system on the critical infrastructure side, where you're talking those 12 or 16 infrastructures that are national in nature and that... Uh, the rest of the economy depends upon. On the software side, I don't think we're ever going to get, I don't think we want to get to a system of government uh, inspection or government pre-approval. I don't think uh, that's necessary. I don't think we'll get there. Instead, I think we are gonna continue to depend upon the post hoc, after the fact, um, private litigation 
system, but that only works if we have a system of a defined standard of care and some defined concept of liability with safe harbor, and as you suggest, maybe with some kind of caps on on liability. We need to bring the insurance companies into that. That's going to be sort of an, I think that's going to be an interface between standards, insurance, and then the private tort litigation system. You're going to let the two parties fight it out without the government in the middle. Now, both of those pillars, the critical infrastructure pillar and the software pillar, they they obviously face challenges. There's political challenges, which is in the United States now are It's very hard to get things, big things through Congress and then just intellectually and conceptually, particularly on the software side, coming up with the sort of tuning the dials and uh, on that liability system is is not going to be easy. And there's some very big Um, companies that will be affected, right? And we always know that there's going to be pushback from that as well. So There's going to be pushback. And I think the reaction to the Biden uh, strategy so far has been muted by corporations, some grumbling some opposition. They haven't gone to full out trench warfare yet, but that's, I think, partly just because they're waiting to see. They know, at least on the liability side, Congress would need to be involved. On the critical infrastructure side, I think a lot of the laws already on the books, which talk about safety and reliability. I mean, we have laws decades old, uh, some of them close to 100 years old, on some of these critical infrastructures that talk about safety or reliability. Those laws, I think, are able to encompass cybersecurity. Um, Although there's a further complication, which is our Supreme Court is skeptical of of regulatory agency claims of authority. So even their clarification from Congress would be useful. Interestingly enough, uh, Congress just last year passed a a little provision, but the only way to do this is incrementally, passed a little provision on medical devices. So medical devices are clearly uh, increasingly networked, interconnected. uh, They have a chip in them. They they receive software upgrades over the internet. Um, They're highly vulnerable. Uh, The Food and Drug Administration regulates medical devices as well as food and drug. I, again, had thought and argued that their existing authority over safety uh, included cybersecurity. They were dubious about that. And last year, Congress did amend the Food and Drug Act to give the the Food and Drug Administration explicit authority uh, to set standards for the cybersecurity of medical devices. So I think if we move incrementally that way, I I don't want to see one big bill introduced into Congress. That would be death because it would go to too many committees and just be too easy to kill. But if you proceed incrementally, one little change for the drinking water system, which is highly decentralized in the United States, one maybe clarification to the Federal Communications Act for telecoms, maybe a change to the Medicare, Medicaid law, making it clear that the authority to regulate hospitals includes the cybersecurity of those hospitals. That may be the way to go on the critical infrastructure side. So let's... let's kind of roll on a little bit and go, okay, so we've got, we're in, we're starting to go into 2023 with a couple of months in now. What do you, what are your biggest areas of concern for US cybersecurity policymakers, I guess, acting on this and how this rolls forward? What are the things that you think top of mind that, that, that's going to be a challenge? A big roadblock is Congress. There are a few members of Congress who are forward thinking on this issue, but They often are stymied by the complexity of our current legislative process. We saw yesterday a hearing which was heavily influenced by anti-China sentiment. I think concerns about China are are legitimate and the competition between the U.S. and China, at least, is, is one of concern. But I'm afraid that China has come to sort of dominate the sort of data security issue, which clearly goes way beyond China. Um, So I I think one of the challenges is the tendency of Congress to get distracted and the tendency of Congress to go for the easy target. Bashing China is currently in the United States an easy target. So I I worry about a, a loss of attention or a loss of focus on this issue. The administration has really, really good people 
working on cybersecurity in the White House and at the Department of Homeland Security in the CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Administration inside our Department of Homeland Security. Uh, really, really good people with decades of, of experience uh, in business and in the public sector. I worry about a loss of energy, a loss of sort of drive and sort of a dissipation of what I see as this this major change in, in emphasis and policy. So just trying to, I guess, force it, not force it through, but get it through, get everyone on board and actually not getting distracted by, look, China obviously has a, seen, the same, exactly. same, seen the same in the UK, it's been banned on uh, government workers' devices and other things. Exactly. But, but yeah. It's quite a popular policy, isn't it, rather than actually dealing with the underlying problems. And I think that's probably what you're trying to get at there, isn't it, that it's saying right. actually making sure we're still remembering why we're doing this. It's not just to bash China or be, be popular. It's actually to make our infrastructure more secure. So what can we expect next? We've got that this has come out. You said that there's been things started to go out around the critical infrastructure. What, what do you see as the, the next steps for, well, for the government? I honestly don't know uh, where they go from here. I, I have not heard a strong desire to move forward on either the healthcare sector or the telecom sector, some of the other sectors that are not addressed so far in the, in the directives or regulations that have been issued. I think telecoms is one of the big glaring missing pieces here where I, again, I think the Federal Communications Commission already has the authority. They've worked hard actually at the FCC to get Chinese equipment. Again, it was all about China to get the Chinese equipment, the Huawei uh, equipment out of the backbone and out of the U.S. infrastructure and to deny operating rights to uh, Chinese companies who had previously been operating inside the United States. Of course, American companies have never been allowed in China on the telecom side, but uh, we had allowed Chinese companies into the United States. Those uh, authorizations have been revoked. Uh, that same authority could actually be used with domestic companies over concerns about the, their security and the security of the homemade uh, equipment. Now that we've eliminated the Huawei equipment, we need to look at the security of some of the homegrown stuff. Um, so I, I wish that issue were to be taken on. I haven't heard anything yet from the administration on that. There is um, another issue lurking, Matt, which is identity and identity uh, creation, authentication. The administration would like to do something on that in the United States, identity and national ID card, anything that come close to being called a national ID card is extremely controversial on both the left and the right. A third issue I think that is not yet getting the attention it deserves is the vulnerability of AI-based products and systems, particularly systems based on machine learning. Uh, we've obviously seen a lot of attention in the past month to uh, chat GPT and its various versions and the issues there about hallucination and uh, flaws in what the large language models produce in terms of uh, just flat out inaccuracies and making stuff up. Uh, those are unintentional errors. There's a huge, huge separate problem with AI systems, which are their vulnerability to adversarial attack. I've written about this. We actually have a, a new paper coming out with Georgetown University and Stanford University on the vulnerability of AI-based systems, particularly those based on machine learning, to adversarial attack. Really scary stuff. And it, that needs to be elevated in the consciousness of both government and uh, corporate folks. Obviously, AI is here. It's already widely dispersed. It's going to become even more ubiquitous. I think that trend is unstoppable, but it comes not only with the bias issues and some of the accuracy issues and reliability issues, but it comes with a huge vulnerability. I think the bias one's really interesting. I spoke to a, a lawyer probably about 18 months ago on this about this. I think there's a European banking legislation that is doing it because it was basically not making the right decisions on approvals for certain things because it was looking at things that definitely shouldn't have been like race or gender and going well historical data has rejected it because of this and that the bias issue has gotten a lot of attention in the united states 
And we have something called the Equal Access to Credit Act and uh, our basic Federal Trade Commission Act and uh, some of our anti-discrimination laws at both the state and the federal level, both for credit as well as for insurance underwriting, do pretty much cover, I believe, the bias issues. That goes all the way back to credit scores and the, the, the basic algorithms in, in a pre-sort of AI sense. That's gotten a lot of attention. It deserves the attention it's been getting. A lot of scientists, a lot of uh, software engineers, a lot of people at universities have poked holes in a lot of these systems in terms of their bias. But I think the issue that is somewhat overlooked and underestimated is the security vulnerability where you have not an unintentional mistake. No one sets out to build a discriminatory product here. No one is trying to be biased in, in building these things. In many ways, they're trying to avoid bias by getting the human out of the loop. But where you have an adversary actively seeking to subvert the system, that's a different issue altogether. And that's these AI systems are vulnerable to the, to the intentional adversarial attack. I've got two final questions for you um, that, before we wrap up. So if you could have one wish, one thing that you could solve in the cybersecurity space, uh, what would it be? Well, actually, something that I haven't uh, talked about, but I think there are basic things that uh, people could do that they're not doing. Uh, in the United States, there's an organization called the Center for Internet Security, which is a nonprofit uh, organization, and they publish a set of uh, critical security controls. Uh, it used to be the top 20. Now the, the list is just 18. I think those 18 you know, you talk about something like um, NIST uh, Special Publication 171 or some of these other standards, hundreds of separate requirements. The people at the CIS have boiled it down to 18. I think those 18 would <laughs> would solve 95% of the problem. I mean, it's the classic problem where doing these things will solve half. The 80-20, uh, isn't it? Like the 80-20 yeah, rule. The 80-20 exactly. rule, exactly, which is what I'm trying to get yeah, to. No worries. <laughs> So I would love to see that more uniformly implemented. And I guess I would like to see regulators move to that kind of approach where instead of making people check the box on hundreds of little separate requirements, think about prioritization and, and then making sure that what you say you're doing, you're actually doing. Yeah. Focus on fundamentals, get that right, and then build it out after that. And one of the things we always like to do is look at, uh, we always like to see if there's other security leaders that we should be talking to and people in this space. Is there anyone that you'd recommend that we should speak to? I have a couple recommendations for you. One is definitely try to get someone on from CISA, that Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Jen Easterly, the head of that organization, phenomenal woman, deep experience. The executive assistant director of that agency for cyber is Eric Goldstein. He would be wonderful. Jen is extremely uh, in demand now, but uh, possibly Eric would come on. Or the uh, staff director for that agency, Brandon Wales, again, someone with uh, deep experience. And then someone currently in the private sector uh, you might want to talk to is Greg Rattray. Greg was for many years uh, head of IT security at J.P. Morgan Chase, has a background in uh, government, uh, military, now is at Columbia University and has his own consulting firm. He spent a lot of time working with the Ukrainians and supporting the Ukrainians on their cybersecurity. It'd be interesting to talk about lessons that he's seen from the experience in a basically a war zone, helping the Ukrainians uh, resist the Russian uh, cyber attacks, which they've done. The response of the Ukrainians has been pretty successful and lessons learned from that and what lessons that might have sort of even outside of a war zone. But in, when you think of sort of nation state adversaries and what we've learned in terms of the capabilities of the Russians versus the vulnerabilities of these, you know, power, uh, water, um, critical infrastructure. Yeah, some great suggestions. So thanks, Jim. Look, I really appreciate having you on. Yeah, my pleasure. Where's the best place to reach out to you and hear, hear more from you? So I'm on LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn to talk about my work. Uh, whenever I post something, I, I put a little thing up on LinkedIn. So I welcome people to connect with me there. Um, I have a website, cybersecuritylawfundamentals.com, where I post updates on cybersecurity law. Um, it's a companion to my book and um, my emails on online as well. Um, jdemps at 
and we'll tag them in the uh, description of the podcast as well. So Great. Thanks, Jane. Appreciate it. Matthew, been a pleasure. Fantastic.